Chief Seco, thank you so much Thanks for so much. taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. I really appreciate it. It's a great honor for the Oral History Program to be able to speak with you. Thank you. Shonavish. Could you tell me uh, what brings you to the, the conference? What brings us to the conference as a, a representative of my people is to reunite the families that were once called black Indians um, and to also tell the history and the story of our people that has been lost or forgotten about. Chief Seiko, now when you say when you say black Indians, many people uh, outside of this conference perhaps would not be familiar uh, with that conference. They, they'll say, well, black and the Indian are kind of separate. Can you explain what the term means, uh, black Indians? Black Indian is a misnomer, the word black, as far as we're concerned. Um, one drop of native blood unites us all, but we've always identified ourselves as uh, we the people, Native American Indians, uh, for the terminology of the United States and what they use. Black Indian, though, it's just a, I think it gives a pictorial or a picture in the mind's eye of what type of Indian, because there are uh, historically been proven separation between different Indian tribes and skin tone and color. I think it allows us to identify which particular Native American tribe or identity, identify the Indian that you're talking about as a whole. Uh, most people use red man as synonymous or red Indian as synonymous as a term, but it's not looked at any way other than being Indian or American. So black identifies the dark skinned Creeks of Muscogee that we were once called. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the Creeks are in Muscogee were people who, can you talk a little bit about that history because they were, were people who were very prominent in what's now the eastern part of the United States? Well yes, before actually the Creek word came into existence, which was created, there was Muscogee or Muscogee as you may have heard. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that was Wali. Um, my particular tribe was Yamasi. Yamasi was considered and is considered in the Industrial Commission, uh, which is a congressional set, as being described factually as, uh, for lack of a better word, African or Negro. Mm -hmm. uh, we were one of the only tribes that were labeled that way, but were a part of the Muscogee Confederacy. Mm -hmm. um, history has proven, though, that we had a very large empire ourselves, being the only tribe that had upper and lower Yamasi. And within that, a lot of tribes you might have heard were a part of that confederation called Muscogee, which was actually Yamasi. Mm -hmm. um, which is the Hichiti, the uh, Appalachee, the Oconee, the Salkehachi, those different tribes, the Hupspa, all those were different villages and tribes under, quote, the Muscogee bloodline, but were actually Yamasi people and citizens or tribal members. I see. Now, in the, in the history books, the only um, uh, reg, uh, citation I've seen about the Yamasi people, uh, and you have to excuse my ignorance, mm -hmm is there was a Yamasi war yes. that took place. Is that the same, were your people involved in that? Yes, my people were involved in that. You're okay. talking about the Yamasi War of 1715. Right. Uh, and what happened in that transpiring aspect of it, uh, uh, historical facts was that we had been working and dealing with the Spaniards for quite some time. We actually interacted with a lot of the colonists that came here, the French, the Scots, mm -hmm. the uh, Spaniards, and the British colonies, or co colonials. And um, what happened basically was that there was a miscommunication and unfair trading practices which led up to the war of Yamasi, or the Yamasi War of 1715. But what history does not also say, it wasn't not just the unfair trading practices, but it was also the um, raping of our women, mm -hmm. the, the taking advantage of the children, the killing of men uh, that also sparked this. And we had a prior war to that, which was the war with the Tuscaroras. Um, that we assisted the Tuscarora for the same type of situation. So that's what led up to the War of Yamasee, uh, the War of 1715. Mm -hmm. uh, contradictive to what history is teaching, we continue to fight, though it never stopped. It is the continuation that you hear of in history with the Seminoles. Mm -hmm. The word Seminole, which is uh, being deprived as runaway, was in reference to, in our historical uh, documents, as running away from that war that continued on with the Yamasi, which started firstly with the Yamasi. So that's where the term Seminole comes from. Also, through history, they talk about a lot of black Seminoles. Well, the mm -hmm. black Seminoles they were talking about and referencing history shows were Yamasi, because mm -hmm. we last were located in northern Florida, which is where my family's from. Okay, and that was, gonna, that was my next question, Chief Seiko, was that what's the relationship between the Yamasi and the black Seminole? But in a sense, you're saying that there is a very tight relationship. That's yes. just a continuation. Yes, that's right, and exactly. Even when you look at the name or the tribe now in Miami, Mikosuki, Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at the actual derivative of it, it was actually Mikisuki, uh, which is our name for chief in Hichiti. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mikosuki speaks a very close derivative of the Yamasic language that they called Hichiti. 
So that's the tie-in, and you'll see that within their uh, historical documents if you go down and visit the Seminole Reservation, mm -hmm. um, and you'll see the pictures of the old or black Seminoles. Predominantly all the pictures there are of black or dark-skinned Seminole women or Mikosuke women. Uh, if you look up the uh, historical archive with Billy Bowlegs and mm -hmm. the rest of those, you see that they were pretty dark. You know, they were black if you would consider them such, uh, based on what their ancestors look like today. So, okay. And Chief Siko, did the when you were growing up, uh, um, how much of this this history uh, was taught to you, and and how was it taught to you? In other words, how did you learn? Because most people cannot go back to 1715 and and whatever heritage they're from. How did you how did you learn this? Who are your elders who taught you? Well, my matriarchs in our family, the matriarchs keep the st the story, the hidden story. Um, the men were more worker or hunter gatherers and such. So, mm -hmm. the story was passed down just by word of mouth from the women to the men or to the children as old folklore and also stories of how we came to be, why we had to move from different areas. Mm -hmm. um, growing up, you know, we knew that we were originally from certain areas in either Florida or South Carolina, and it comes to be, you know, a story given to the women in just a very gradual way. Um, while we're also taught customs and traditions, you know, things that we, the average person, might overlook. You know, an example would be maybe your mother, um, certain practices, how she cooked dinners, uh, certain uh, what you call religious beliefs about, mm -hmm. you know, um, someone walking in the house or, you know, uh, cayenne pepper being hung at the door, things of that nature, which was tribal for us. But for the most part, the tradition was passed on through our grandmothers and great grandmothers. Uh, myself, particularly, it was talked about as far as the history of our people, why we came to Tampa, and how that all coexisted. My family also on my father's side, which is the Jones, we're related to Sam Jones, which is called Abiyako or Arapaka mm -hmm. to the Seminoles. Uh, so, you know, a lot of history was there, but there's a lot of untold history, and the reason why was because that our people were being killed, uh, especially the men. Men were targeted as potential threats to the movement back then when it came to Andrew Jackson. So the mothers had to take it upon themselves to hide us, to keep us protected, to make sure that our family lineage stayed on. But uh, contrary to that, I apologize. Uh, it was always customary in our family that the matriarchs carried the bloodline. Mm -hmm. So as long as the woman could identify whom we were, we continued on to know ourselves as such. And that's what happened. So we were able to be able to identify ourselves. But as the story told me uh, from my grandmother, my great-grandmother, she said that um, a lot of us took on names of different tribes just to protect us, such as the Cherokee, mm -hmm. um, the Seminoles, uh, those who were unconquered or considered unconquered back in those days. Mm -hmm. And were there, when you were growing up, I mean, it sounds like that women played a huge part in, in keeping alive the heritage, teaching. Were there women who stood out in your mind, thinking back in your youth, um, who really were uh, maybe great storytellers yes. or people who? Yes. Uh, one of the major women in my matriarchal lineage uh, would be Roberta Wright. She married uh, Oscar Rem. Um, and we lived in what you call Northern Florida out there, Live Oak, uh, up in Northern Florida. Central. Oh yeah, Live Oak, okay. Yeah. Wow. And so Roberta Rim, uh, which is her married name, her maiden name is Wright, uh, mm -hmm. kept the stories passed down to my grandmother, which was Mary Magdalene Heath Wright. Um, and then she from that point passed it on to my mother. And what happened was it was just a matriarchal situation, but these are the women that were important to, to us. We called, uh, most people call them Big Mama. Okay. You know what I mean? But the matriarchs kept and hold the stories to our people. Okay. And in counterpart to, to the stories, were there other uh, cultural practices that you were taught, uh, maybe in terms of medicinal practices, oh, yes. uh, remedies? Yes, uh, yes. We, we kept herbs, and, and there was, contrary to what, you know, society has modernized so fast and so quickly that we tend to forget that it was not that long ago that we were dependent solely on herbs, uh, solely on certain plants like the aloe plant. Mm -hmm. um, certain uh, mints and leaves and things of that nature. So the herbal side of things were just, it was second to none to us. Mm -hmm. It was just a continued practice that we as children never thought anything second about it, you know what I mean? It, it becomes second nature to most people now who depend right. on pharmacies. But yeah. for us, it was hand over foot. We didn't get any medication. I don't take medication to this day because okay. I weren't taking, we weren't taking aspirin and things like wow. that. There was always a remedy to something, even when it comes to like gout, you know, the. Um, um, certain trees get rid of gout and things that were just passed down by the women that knew who were considered the medicine uh, or doctors in our, our family or midwives or nurses. A lot of my matriarchs in my family had those titles, RNs, and I, I couldn't figure out how they got it because they never went to school for okay. it. But you know, they had a uh, profound sense 
of uh, herbal remedy and, and how to take care of you, mm -hmm. what herbs to use, what foods to even feed us during a time to, to help us out with you know, stomach aches and things of that nature. Um, I think someone taken away from their identity or culture can't identify these practices as being tribal until they're actually told where the source of this information is coming from. Mm -hmm. So I do know as well that you know most of modern day medicines use tribal remedies and herbs now because the tribal people were in tune with what plant life was used to fix certain ailments, as they would say. So they're trying to patent all of those things now, that's right? True, exactly. <laughs> and that's not the native way to us, you know. Like how do you patent something that the mother gives to you, right. you know, to take care of? You know, you can't create the earth; the earth created us. Exactly. So you know, we just find it fascinating. But yes, you're right, and exact. Chief Seiko, were there? How were? How did people keep uh, the community together? Were there uh, celebrations or certain? Because uh, it's very hard. I mean, in this, uh, in the larger society, which places very little uh, emphasis on on culture, and everything is the future, the future of this, future of that. I mean, what were some of the ways that uh, adults, as you were growing up, kind of tried to keep uh, a sense of community, a sense of identity, kind of? Whole. Well, customarily, uh, what they call powwows for us are in American language called family reunions. Mm -hmm. So we would have family reunions two to three times a year, uh, depending on when the season changed. Uh, it was customary for us that when someone or elder got sick, that we would all meet on our land. We have family land uh, that was hundreds of acres that we would all go out. We didn't have to worry about police department or anything of that nature. We were able to freely run. Uh, where our family was and where they were buried at. But for us, they were considered family reunions. They were nothing more than that for mm -hmm. us, and we got a chance to be able to speak our language and talk and be free without having to worry about the stress and pressure of society uh, living away from our family land. But that's mostly how we did it, you know, outside of um, emergency situations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was emergency family things, and family would travel from all of the United States to meet with Big Mama, the matriarch. I mean, when she called us, so that's how we normally did things, though. How was language taught? I mean, language is very hard for a lot of Native American groups because, you know, again, there, there may not be uh, everyday opportunities to speak language, but how was language, how did you learn language and how has it been passed down? From a, as a, from a baby, mm -hmm. certain words outside of the American language, the English language, just used um, as like little pet peeves or nicknames or ways to identify certain things. It wasn't done because I, I realize now from what my mother has told me and her mother told her mm -hmm. that, you know, there was a fear of us speaking our language because it would identify us with a certain group, and I didn't get that. But the way language was taught to us is by identifying objects and things with non-English names. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a child, you don't identify, okay, well, I'm being taught something foreign or something customary it was just normal for us. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something that we identify as most people were like, uh, well, I'm learning my Native American language or I'm, I'm right. learning how to speak this language. It was just natural. It was never something forced upon us or looked at in a forceful way or that you know uh -huh. we had to learn it culturally. It was just given to us and we accept it and we speak it to our family members now and to our children. So as part of everyday life, there wasn't any right. like a schoolhouse or anything necessarily. That's correct. That's correct. It was definitely a part of uh, everyday life, because what was told to us was like education outside of my mm -hmm. uh, great grandmother was really unheard of. Like a lot of the men could not read or write the uh, English language. But what I found out was that they didn't want to learn or read or write the English language. Okay. It was only until after. Uh, we became more civilized of seeing opportunity for colleges and things like that, that it was necessary to do these things. But the men and the women necessarily did not want to actually learn the language unless they was forced to, to uh, be able to uh, sign deeds or get insurance and things of that nature that happened later on. Sure. Was there um, a relationship? Did people talk about, be, you know, because of this very rich cultural legacy, uh, uh, any time a relationship between say indigenous culture and African culture. Did, did, did people talk about that when you were growing up? Yes, yes, we were, we were able to be able to identify like who were actually, you know, from uh, a plantation or considered Negro as an mm -hmm. slave mentality who might have came like, uh, when it came to Big Mama, our matriarch, mm -hmm. Roberta uh, Wright, she married a man who was considered and his family were a part of a plantation and mm -hmm. were slaves. But then there were also the side of us that knew that we were uh, full-blooded Native Americans and mm -hmm. you know the dark-skinned people that you saw on this side that were 
obviously overwhelmingly dark uh, what, where that bloodline came from and how it came to be. But it was something that was accepted proudly. It was never something that was shunned upon if we had someone that was from the outside coming into the family because the women took it upon themselves to choose whom they wanted to marry. You know, So they, they loved you and you had something to present and you came in traditionally, which is the way it was and, was, and willing to move onto her land, which is what happened in our case, that the man came to live with us or her. Uh -huh. And, you know, they was, they was good with that. But it was never uh, something that was looked at in a negative light. Okay. Did you have and did the community, I mean, during the period of time, uh, you know, during, say, the Jim Crow era or into the 60s or 70s or 80s, what were, like, race relations like in the, the larger society vis-a-vis -vis the Yamasi people? You know? As it was described to me by my matriarchs in those times, we stayed to ourselves. My great-grandmother would... She, she didn't, as she called the pale face, she never wanted a pale face in our house. Mm -hmm. uh, I never saw a white man in her house. Mm -hmm. um, she never, wouldn't even use certain terminology like the word cracker. You know, that was never something that she gave homage to because she said it, it was looked down as a bad, a bad situation to say cracker because it gave prestige to a certain class of people. Mm -hmm. um, but the race thing for us and my family in the Yamasi was to stay to ourselves. We've always just wanted to be left alone, and that's what I really have been able to identify growing up, to be in a certain area by ourselves, no one bothering us, mm -hmm. you know, and, and being able to just play and have fun as a child. Uh, so I don't think it really affected our family okay. the way it did other people's family, uh, based on where we were, and that's how we really identified. Though. But again, uh, we looked at other races as separate from ourselves and did not want to mix in with it, even though we knew we also had a uh, pale face within our blood. Mm -hmm. But it was accepted, though they were still all family, but we just stayed away from it. Okay. Did, and did the Yamasi have a, a relationships? Like, I mean, now with the conference, you see different people coming together from the Bahamas, Mexico, Texas. Uh, when you were growing up, was there were there attempts to bring t together people along those lines? Or did you talk about people who had left Florida and ended up in Mexico or oh, Oklahoma? Yes, or? yes we, it's known in our family that we have Dominican cousins, Cuban cousins, um, people that aren't like um, uh, married in recently, but long-term marriages mm -hmm. that identify themselves as Dominican, as Cuban, as um, uh, Mexican. You know, we have, and, and Caribbeans. Mm -hmm. We have a long list and line of people that are part of our family that we never looked separately. They just lived in those places. That's how we always was identifying. You know, we talked about our cousins or relative. They were just living in, you know, Bahamas, or they was living in Jamaica, or they was living in Cuba, or Dominica. It was never looked at the way society puts us today as a race or a segregational situation where, you know, they're considered identified as mm -hmm. a particular, you know, race. We just saw them as family that just lived on islands. You know, that's how we were taught. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chief Seiko, did you, when you were growing up, did you have a sense that you wanted to, um, well, I was going to ask you when you were, say, a young man, mm -hmm. uh, like a teenager, were you thinking about um, what you wanted to, to be as an adult? Were you kind of planning that? Or, or was that something that your parents had kind of maybe said, hey, we'd like you to do this? Or was that kind of more of an open kind of situation? Honestly, it was, it was it's funny that you asked that. It was a non-pressured situation. You know, I never knew what I was being prepared for. Uh, as far as my family was concerned, but I was actually being prepared for different things. My thought was to do music, because I always loved music. We always mm -hmm. were doing drumming circles and ceremony out in the woods, so I always gravitated toward music. And that's what I saw myself doing. Uh, but my grandmother and them were real steadfast on certain things that they saw me doing for the family and keeping the family together. And I had no clue that it would be chief, but you know <laughs> that's what it was equating to, okay. um, to keep the family together. And they're real big on family and uh, staying together. But again, I wanted to do music because I just gravitated toward the drum. I love drumming. So that's what that happened. So, you, But you were able to kind of integrate both in a certain way? Yes, actually, I were able to do that. Okay. And they gave me the freedom to do that as well. You know, uh, We can be at this point in time. We can be whatever we want to be and choose to be as long as we put our family first mm -hmm. and realize our culture and heritage and identify ourselves uh, with uh, whom we are and what we are and what our ancestors have done in order to make it, make sure we're here today. And that's what was really pushed for us to realize that the sacrifices that was made, uh, even if it wasn't went, or they didn't go into depth about it as a young person or a teenager, we needed to know that there were sacrifices made for us to have the freedom to run on the land that we had and, and you know, do the things that we do and hunt. 
So, you know, that's what I was able to identify with, which brought me full circle back to this position here. Okay. How is a, in, in the Amasi tradition, how is a chief chosen and, and what responsibilities does that entail? Uh, chiefs were chosen by most of the time the matriarchs. Mm -hmm. The matriarchs chose a chief and the matriarch could be a chief. Um, but you have realized that our society, which is matriarchal, was ran by the women. But there was a head woman that they considered, and most of the time she was the eldest woman. So the decision was made based on uh, the, uh, the hero within your heart, uh, what you decide to do, how much you embellished in culture. But it was also passed by bloodline. So if my grandmother or my great-grandmother was a chiefess or a matriarch, she was able to pass that down as long as a female lived in our mm -hmm. bloodline, you know, our clan or tribe existed. And that's mostly how our bloodline, uh, when it comes to lineage, was considered, and chiefs were made that way. Okay. How, how, when did you first realize that you may be on a path towards, towards being a chief? And, and how did it first occur? Uh, my mother, when my great-grandmother passed, um, she made her transition. My mother was able to open up some documents that were left to her that identified her position and why she was a uh, big mama to everyone else in our family, even though our family was like to me countless. Um, but we knew that my grandmother was identified by our clan, our band, in a certain light, a certain way, but we weren't able to put our fingers on it mm -hmm. until she passed. And when she passed, she left all the information to us to be able to see it. And the family members were able to verify um, those who knew what that was. And to uh, go back to something else as well, when you were saying for position in chiefs, uh, when a family became too big mm -hmm. and we no longer could live in the same area, we would move out, you know, you create your own family. If your family came and you had 10 or 11 children in your family, which is, my family has very large children like that, uh -huh. you become your own clan or band. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you automatically become a chief of your clan and band. That's just yeah. tradition and custom. Because no one can take away that identity if you're taking on the role of a leader, if you're taking on the role and position of responsibility to make sure your family eat, that is a chief regardless mm -hmm. to if someone appointed it to you. Okay. And what are the, so uh, could you ex explain more, Chief Siko, about some of the other responsibilities of being a chief? What does that, what does that really mean? Uh, uh, today's society, today for yes. myself, being a chief is being a father, I have to be a brother, I have to be a cousin, I have to be a listener, I have to be, you know, uh, the patient one. It's, it's more now than it was back then, which was, life was more simpler for chiefs, you know. We had to mm -hmm. politically keep bands and clans together and just have to politic with other chiefs and elders every now and then. But now it's being um, a father and a chief to everyone. You know, everyone has issues, everyone has problems, mm -hmm. everyone's looking for a resolution. They're looking for you to be able to come to and talk to when they're having these problems. They're looking for a solution to things. <laughs> um, you know, and it's, it could be as simple as, you know, gas, traveling, traffic tickets now. Uh -huh. I think the responsibility of modern day life has put much more on chiefs in today's society than our parents or our ancestors had to deal with. Outside of just being able to be uh, recognized and identified, um, you know, it becomes just a broader scope of things because now you're responsible for 300 people or possibly however many people that's in within a band or clan or a tribe. You have to be not just their father, their chief, you have to be their friend. Mm -hmm. So the responsibility has broadened so much more in the, uh, the, the spectrum of life has given us so much more to be responsible for that uh, it keeps most chiefs that are really doing their job, not just for the financial obligations that they feel they need to right. have for their family, you know, their, their tribe. It gives them a much broader spectrum and it gives them much more to do. Uh, if they're truly uh, in tune with their people, if they truly take to heart each and every one's problems or situation. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot different than the, the stereotype is, is just someone who leads and yes. everyone else kind of follows, but what you're yes. saying is much more complicated. Yes, because in order to lead, it's not just about leading. You don't want people to follow you. That's the thing. You want people to have their independence. And I think that people get the, the position of chief uh, misconstrued with boss. And it's not about being a boss. A chief, to me, is a good listener, mm -hmm. uh, a good leader, someone that's willing to go ahead of you and show you by example and not just stick you out there by yourself. And uh, it can be no different, and it is no different for me than operating my own family mm -hmm. and uh, understand that my family has their stress because I have to sometimes negate some of their issues and put it on the back burner for the betterment of the tribe or for other people who may have issues that to me are a little bit more, um, what's the word, uh, high-end or important to me at that point in time. But 
it can be very stressful at times. Right. What are, I wonder if you could give me um, an example, say, of a, of a stressful situation that you've had to face as a chief and maybe how you were able to, to resolve it. Oh, I got countless of those. Sure sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, you know, one of the, the main things is this, the safety and freedom of my people. You know, and today's society has uh, so many rules and, and so many regulations that um, put uh, us in a very um, unbalanced situation. You know, because when you start talking about tribal rights and autonomy uh, of tribal governments and nation, and our people take that to heart and they're moving according to them freely amongst, you know, what we call our homelands. And they have to follow the rules according to what states say now mm -hmm. to be able to abide and you know, be a good citizen. And some of them don't necessarily look at themselves as a United States citizen. They look at themselves as tribal. So one of the things have been, you know, um, arrest, um, traffic tickets. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the biggest thing is child welfare issues and laws. You know, as we do have ICWA that works for us, which is ICWA or Indian Child Welfare Acts, mm -hmm. that has been the most stressful thing for me because I need to make sure that our children are able to retain their identity, mm -hmm. their culture, and their heritage. Mm -hmm. And when, when our, our children are put in jeopardy or uh, put into a system that it goes against or teaches them anything opposite to whom we are, that jeopardizes our extinction as a tribe, mm -hmm. as a nation. And it's something that we as Yamasi have really worked hard for because we've been written out of history uh, countless times just because of whom we have been. So that's been the most stressful thing out of all the things that uh, I've been able to deal with, just keeping my children home. And when I say my children, all of the children within the nation and the tribe. Okay. And that's in mainly now in northern Florida or in yes. also in South Carolina, but mainly northern Florida? Yes, well, our family is in northern Florida, from actually from Miami all the way up to California. We have tribal members all over the United States right now, even in Mexico and okay. Canada. So, you know, anytime there's issues, I'm dealing with it from the perspective <laughs> of the United States and not just right. a certain territory, but we are right. just recently returned home to uh, what history, history called Pocataliku. Uh, you may call it Pocataligo, mm -hmm. uh, which is Allendale, South Carolina, which is one of the youngest counties in that area. Uh, but history shows that Allendale is actually a branch off of Hampton and Barnwell. Mm -hmm. uh, Hampton was created from Buford. Buford, as you know, was part of the Yamasi War. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, We've just recently been returned home, given the keys to the city, oh, wow. and uh, plan on coming back home in August. Uh -huh. That must have been really emotional. Uh, yes, yes, it's very. Can emotional. you describe that giving the keys to the city, and, and after centuries, uh, what was that like? Uh, and how many did other people from the tribe take part in that? Uh, was that? Uh, well, what it was like, it was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Uh, because we were able, and our family has always been there. I don't want no one to think that we weren't there. We was right. always there as Yuchi uh, and different names that we went by, but we were again labeled just as blacks. Uh, mm -hmm. But it was overwhelming to be able to come home and bring my people back home and say, okay, we can come now finally back historically to mm -hmm. South Carolina once and for all. We don't have to hide anymore. We can be who we are and be well accepted in Allendale County and be accepted in the city of Allendale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to have the government officials in that area bring us home and and was happy to see us return. It was a very overwhelming situation. And yes, we had uh, tribal members participate in the ceremony itself, the key ceremony that traveled from all of the United States wow. to uh, participate because it was a truly historical moment for us and very humbling for us to be a part of. Wow. Did you, and uh, since that time, well, I mean, in, the, in terms of the conference here, what, is, what uh, are some of the, the hopes that you have and, and some of your goals for say some of the outcomes of, of this conference? Uh, the hopes and goals. The hopes and goals truly aren't mine. Mm -hmm. I think they're for the indigenous people who have been able to identify themselves of uh, natives or tribes of color, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to identify themselves other than just being African Americans and be able to reunify with those of us who've always held the title of natives or indigenous, mm -hmm. such as the Seminole Maroons, uh, the uh, what you call Gullah Geechee. Mm -hmm. the uh, Mikosuki, the Seminoles, you know, to be able to bring our people back home and unite as one, uh, as history has shown. And, and the information is out there. The information is there. That's my biggest goal right now is to show people that the information is there. This mm -hmm. is not something we're making up. This is not something I decided to wake up one day and be. This is who I am. You know, and you just have to do the proper research to see because as, the, uh, as we say, and I was told by my family, when the colonists came, they, they doc documented everything they did. They wanted to perpetuate the success 
And it was one of the reasons, as my grandparents told me, that they didn't want us to read, because to read would be able to identify ourselves. Mm -hmm. And now we have the ability with modern technology and the things that are going on, such as Google, to be able to research and find your true identity, find your people, find your bloodline, find your history. So I think what's happening here, um, under the auspicious of the National Park Services and those people who are participating, is a very great um, thing that's happening, and I think it's a starting point that will spread for people who can uh, honestly identify themselves uh, outside of Africa, you mm -hmm. know, that were already here and have ancestry here that cannot put themselves on a slave ship or a part of a product role or document role, mm -hmm. being property of someone. I think this is a great start for people to be able to necessarily identify that. And even the terminology Underground Railroad Conference, mm -hmm. you know, when they say Underground Railroad, people think literally uh, train tracks, you know, that Harry <laughs> Tubman used train right. tracks. But yeah. what it really does and reflects back to historically that she had Native American ancestry and the mm -hmm. railroad that they're talking about were Native trails that she took that uh, were not taken by the colonists or the Europeans out of fear of snakes or swampland and things of that nature. So there's a lot of symbolism behind the Underground Railroad Conference and what's going on here. But my goal is again for us the unification of all people and it's not just about black or white, it's about us as a whole because we're all sitting here on this planet we call mother. You know, so if we can just identify ourselves and stop looking at color, but mm -hmm. accept that some of us have native or indigenous blood, you know, that is privy to this part of the, the world. Mm -hmm. And we keep it moving and start looking at things on a global perspective versus identifying ourselves domestically right now. Okay. What are some, uh, if, you were, if you were putting together um, and you were working with a teacher who is uh, trying to, to get this information across to their, their students, what are some good sources that you, you could, could just give to them? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what would be some sources that you would say, well, don't probably stay away from those, but probably use these? What would be some examples of a curriculum that... Well, what I would say, firstly, I wouldn't say don't or stay away from anything. I think uh -huh. all information is pertinent because you get the big picture, as I've been shown. There's a puzzle of a, uh, or pieces of a puzzle that shows a picture, a portrait. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to stay away from one piece of the puzzle won't allow you uh, to identify what the picture is you're looking at. You know, a couple pieces can change the whole perception of something. Mm -hmm. But if there was resources that I would uh, have teachers gravitate toward, I think it would be toward congressional documents, it would be definitely toward um, particular art um, authors mm -hmm. and their documentation, such as um, the Romance of Carolina, as far as our people's concerned. I would have people even look into the Department of the Interior's um, uh, roles and, and historical documents, not just the Dolls' roles, mm -hmm. and things that were created in, uh, by those people who we knew had an agenda against the Native American people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's the biggest part that I would say that if you can identify that there was an agenda planned and it was obviously one because uh, it was about land and it was about mm -hmm. colonizing this new land and creating this new modern society and situation, I think that you have to be very careful when trying to identify with certain documentation by these people within that puzzle, but also look at the things that's not being told, the historical archives, things that aren't readily being put in the school mm -hmm. curriculum, you know, so that you can see the uh, motivation of a person and why they would write people to be extinct or why they would say these people no longer exist and how they would benefit from it. But um, I would always say go into the archives, go into uh, the things that are not mainstream or provided to us. Mm -hmm. Chief Siko, what is the, uh, the, the Yamasi relationship to, um, to the earth? What is the, how, how is the relationship seen? Or is it a relationship? Is it more of a uh, just a common being? Our our relationship to the earth is this is we consider her our mother. Mm -hmm. uh, this was considered uh, key or wachi in our language. Uh, wachi or key is a question for our mother. Um, we are part of the mound builder society, so we looked at the mother as a womb. So when we built mounds, a lot of time we was holding these meetings and tribal meetings inside of the womb of our mother. That's how we perceived it. A lot of the burial mounds that people are unearthing and, and looking mm -hmm. into now, when you see these burial mounds and these what they call mittens, it was our way of putting our people back into the womb of the mother in the fetal position mm -hmm. so that it can return the same way you came into it. We look at our relationship with, with our mother as that of, um, I would like to say symbiotic, but it's not, uh, as our, her children. 
Mm -hmm. You know, and our job is to, as we take things, to give things back so that it can be provided for the next generation of people. We never looked at the mother as our own. We never looked at it as being owned. You know, as our great chiefs would once say, you know, that this is not something for me to sell. This is not something for me to give away or give you any rights to. What I can say is that she is freely ours to share as we're all from her. And that's our relationship to the mother, that we respect her, we love her, we know that if we do not take care of our mothers, just like we do any parent, that she won't be here for us to survive. And um, really important is bloodline and, and survival. Every animal have the instinct to survive. And if you're not careful and you, you take away your source of life, your source of nutrients, if you drain her, you, you beat her down and beat her up, she can't provide for you the proper way as a parent should. Mm -hmm. So you know, our job is to take care of her. Our job is to make sure that she has and, and what she needs. And in order to do that, we have to change the mentality of our people to stop looking at something, uh, this mother and this earth, as something that's plentiful and will always be around. Mm -hmm. Maybe for you, maybe for your <laughs> grandchildren, but maybe not for your generations to come. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we look at her and respect her the same way we all should, our women, our mothers, those who give life, because without a woman, there would be no man nor woman. Women give life to everything. So that's our relationship with mother, and that's our outlook on mother. Okay. What are some of the, it sounds like uh, storytelling is, is a tradition that was very important that you were kind of imbued with. Are there stories of, of, uh, or kind of epic uh, tales or, or traditions that, are, are, that you try to pass down, say from you know, the 1700s or even earlier, are there, are there kind of uh, I guess the term I'm trying to get at, it, epic keeps mm -hmm. on coming to mind, but uh, almost um, like major stories that you want young people in the society to, to learn. Well, the stories you know, that people look at tribal and traditionally that holds value to most people are stories that are remembered. Mm -hmm. That's the key, and, and you'll see that as a, a truth within most Native American traditions and culture. It's mm -hmm. the stories that the elders have remembered to pass down. For us, mostly, our stories pertain to evolution of life, okay. how things exist. We have to and try to explain about the Thunderbird, which was the pterodactyl in history and science. We want to explain about the giants that were here. We have conversations about the ants, as we call the ants, the, the ant people, you know, where we found and got our technology from uh, when it comes to mound building. That's something that most people don't know. Uh, we were told and taught that the ants were our people, ancient people that uh, taught us how to build mounds. Ants are the only ones that you see can actually produce a mound today, uh -huh. and they don't fall in on the cave in. <laughs> right. yeah. So that's true. Know, <laughs> these are ways that we explained our mm -hmm. history and our science to our children, and passed down our tradition and cultures okay. uh, in a common sense way that may sound, especially when men spoken in a certain tongue, and you translate something. Mm -hmm. um, the word translate means to change. So when you change it from the original tongue, it sounds a lot of times far fetched. Where for us, it just makes common sense. You know, and that's how we traditionally passed on stories, but not in a way to be uh, considered fables or as they call long tales to right. make these great men or women seem to be superheroes. Uh, but we do identify them and their stories or such as that, you know, to be able to pass down tradition, tradition, and culture. Okay. What about the more recent uh, history? Like I'm thinking of, uh, again, the, the Yamasi War mm -hmm. and European colonization. I mean, how is that? How do you teach young people about uh, about that? It was such a, it seems like in one way, such a rupture in, in indigenous histories of the Americas. But how do you broach that with, with youth? Uh, with our youth, we, we tell them the truth. We don't water it down. Mm -hmm. We put it in a way that is accepted as today. You know, there is no way that you can say someone was raped. There is no other mm -hmm. way that you can say someone was, was molested or taken advantage of or ripped off. You know, these are the words that we have to use because these are what our children are being encompassed with today. This is what they hear. Mm -hmm. So when we're sharing these stories of history and past, um, the tale that is told or the old English tongue that was used is no longer needed for the day. We can just say it in a way that they can relate to in everyday um, life experiences. You know, look, you know, real simple. You let your friend hold this. You promise to do this for your friend. They're supposed to give you this in return. It didn't happen. It creates friction between you. You might fight. You might just go your separate ways and never speak again. But there's something that happened. And so we try to put it in terminology that they can comprehend. And we start with the children. You know, the children are the key because those were the lessons uh, come in play. You teach the children yeah. the history now and you teach them in a, in a way that has moral and it teaches them value and respect 
then they'll get it later on when they hear the story again. Do most of the children in the tribe tend to be uh, homeschooled, or is yes. there a common? Okay. Yes, I'm glad you said it. You <laughs> answered it for me. Okay. You know, we um, are truly believers of homeschooling by the mothers. The women are the first teachers, mm -hmm. uh, and that is a tradition that we still hold true to this day. We do give our our people and our tribe members opportunity to put their children in public schools. We don't mind or yeah. charter schools or private schools. That's your right to mm -hmm. do that. But for the most part, we found that most of our women and the families um, homeschool their daughters and their sons to give them, uh, they feel a better education because it's a broader spectrum. We're able to teach them mm -hmm. um, outside of a, uh, the, the learning curve that most public schools have, we're able to teach them based on where we think they are. You know, not just where society say, you know, you're in first grade now because you've read all of what we say you need, yeah. and next year you'll be in second grade. We find that children's brains are able to, uh, in our tribe and in other tribes, we respect the child's brain because a child learns how to speak a language within a year or two. Whereas an adult right now, it may take you two or three years without the Pimsleur approach or whatever language programs right. out there to pick up another language. Right. So the child brain is, is really moving a lot faster mm -hmm. than an adult brain, and we know they can simulate a lot more information. So homeschooling is more important because we're able to uh, perpetuate more information to the child, and the child has a broader comprehension and understanding of what's being given to them. Okay. There, now, I, uh, Chief Siku, I think I mentioned earlier one of the... One of the um, Native American tribes that we work with, uh, uh, the Porch, uh, Porch Creek, Creek Band, right. and they have recently uh, broke ground and they're building a, a museum. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and part of the way the museum has been explained to us is a way both to educate people within uh, within the tribe, but also to educate outsiders or, or visitors. Um, uh, is the do the Yamasi do similar things in terms of? of museums or, or places that people can come and, and learn, or is it more of a uh, more informal? It's been more of informal, but we've learning now that we need to get out the box that we've been in because, again, uh, our mothers were very protective of us and keeping a lot of our information and, and history to ourselves mm -hmm. because of their personal experiences with it being destroyed and taken right. and, you know, I mean, entire houses being burnt down that were considered museums to us. So now, you know, we are getting in a position because of technology and security. We're feeling more comfortable to open up those type of situations, and we're currently working on a uh, mini museum of our own to be able to share our history, our culture, our practices, much like what the Gullahs are doing in South Carolina, which a lot of that is uh, not just African history, but Native American history as well, you know, especially from the basket weaving and things of that nature. Um, so we are becoming more um, uh, acceptant of mm -hmm. society and what we can do to protect our history and culture. So we are going to be uh, building museums and have plans to build a lot more museums uh, in the future. Oh wow! And that, that was my next question: was what kind of relationship you you had with the Gullahs in terms of? Because I know they have placed a big emphasis on kind of projecting their history and trying to kind of re-educate people about who they are as a people. Our relationship with them is we have let them be them and live their mm -hmm. lives as freely to be able to identify themselves. And they subtly talk about our identification or our um, union at one point in time. Mm -hmm. um, we don't try to overstep our boundaries and we have not overstepped our boundaries by trying to infringe in on their culture and identity of whom they call themselves. Uh, and it's been a very um, passive relationship. And we are now just now opening the doors to have a more a government to government relationship with them mm -hmm. as our cultures are so closely resembling, you know, they were very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because of the experience they had with the Yamasi in Beaufort County, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. But um, we have very rarely uh, spoken or interacted with them um, to be able to allow them to do what they need to do for themselves and, and try not to outshadow them mm -hmm. um, because of our unique history uh, prior to uh, their existence. Okay. Uh, Chief Siku, I know I've uh, kept you a long time, but that's I wonder if. Um, what are some of the some of the uh, maybe ideas or initiatives that you, that you may have on the horizon in terms of both strengthening the the position of of the people, but also uh, maybe other educational activities uh, initiatives that you you're particularly excited about? Puni Maskupili Yamasi, we the Yamasi people have broad ideas. Technology has allowed us and enabled us to to think endlessly. 
when it comes to uh, subjecting ourselves back to mainstream and putting ourselves in the indigenous form. Mm -hmm. the, the main idea that we have and what we want to make sure is perpetuated is that we were never extinct. We, you, can't, mm -hmm. you, know, you can't just get rid of a people of this skin tone and description so easily, um, you know what <laughs> I mean, and who had such a large and vast empire at one time. You know, so our thing and our main focus is being able to identify ourselves and our people being able to come home and identify themselves. Also to be able to practice our culture and our heritage rights with other tribes, reuniting mm -hmm. with the other tribes such as the Seminoles, such as the Mikosuke, uh, mm -hmm. such as the Appalachian. You know, we want to be able to do that freely without the, the tainting of the, the word quote and misnomer black. You mm -hmm. know, we are just tribal, we're indigenous. Uh, so, you know, our, our goals and our wishes are so broad in the spectrum right now mm -hmm. uh, because, again, we got the authorization and okay from the elders to finally speak up and, you know, have all the blood, lineal descendants and all the ways that we kept uh, track of ourselves uh, willing to be released. You know, so it, it just becomes an overwhelming situation. But again, uh, mm -hmm. we have no particular um, short-term ideology about how we were projecting what we want to do for our tribe and nation and where we see it going. Mm -hmm. You want to, because in many ways you're trying to respect the, the wishes and, and of other groups, that's of correct. other peoples. That's yeah. correct. And that's, the, that's been the key factor, not overshadowing mm -hmm. or coming in and laying claim to uh, all of this land or because we were here or there or trying to lay claim to or make people be forced upon themselves to identify us. Um, because to identify us would put a very large dent in certain tribal groups' history and would have to uh, actually say, well, according to history, you all might be Yamasi. We're trying not to go that route because mm -hmm. we know that through time and evolution, all things change. Uh, but again, want to be able to come back to our people, celebrate with them, and uh, share in our rich history and culture, and even give them certain things they might not have known as well as far as in what we was taught historically and anciently amongst our people and tribal elders. Mm -hmm. Are there other people you mentioned earlier, Harriet Tubman, and I think very few people would even understand that she had indigenous roots. Are there other people like historical figures that uh, uh, you can think of that would kind of surprise people? This person had uh, native ancestry. Oh, oh wow. Uh, for the younger youth and the children, there's a lot of hip hop artists uh, that do um, based on their blood descent. There are a lot of uh, older people that were, I, I will just say this real loosely, right. there's a lot of musicians that uh, mainstream society has um, loved historically uh -huh. that were of the Yamasi bloodline and, and identify themselves as such and you can easily find out whom they are uh -huh. just by finding out where they are when it comes to Yamasi history such as Macon, uh, the Okmoji River and, and people that lived in those areas that would give you a sign of whom I'm talking about. Uh, but there are plenty of people that I would love to just identify and put them out there. But, you know, privacy is, is and privacy is their, their key right now. And when they're right. ready to identify themselves, uh, they would. But we have a lot of movie actors as well, actors okay. that re readily know themselves and have contacted us, uh, knowing who their bloodline is and where they descend, they descend from. So, yes, there's a lot of people that uh, identify themselves with Yamasi. Do you get a sense that there are now, at this point in history, there's more people ready to identify themselves openly as Yamasi than there were maybe 10 years ago? Or? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, the sense comes from something that's just common. The, mm -hmm. Again, we talked about earlier, the uh, ability now to prove through technology, you know, going online, Googling things, mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, before you might have had to travel physically by car to a, or, um, a museum or a library somewhere to get certain documentation that was archived. You know, now technology has given all of us the ability to be able to come back and say now, uh, even with what you're doing now for us as project's concerned, to be able to come back and say, okay, put two and two together and I got that. You know, okay. I'm ready now because that uh -huh. makes sense. That lines up what my grandmother told me or, or grandfather told me. Uh, but there are a lot of people now that are being to, able to identify and have, like you said, the want to be able to now speak and tell people, look, this is who I am mm -hmm. proudly, mm -hmm. and I'm not looked at as crazy or um, strange or I'm making something up. So, yes. Right. Okay. If you had, uh, Chief Seiko, the, the opportunity, as you know, as you know, as we all know, the teaching of American history is very uh, political. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but if you had the ability to go into an American history textbook today, as, as it's taught, um, what would you change? Oh, everything. <laughs> <laughs> everything. Because, as I think we spoke about this earlier, um, the intentions of the person who's writing, 
the, the purpose behind it. A lot of ego is into our education system, and, mm -hmm. and a lot of us who are teachers and educators, as I, I deem myself to be such, know this, you know, that we now can prove otherwise. And it's much just like mm -hmm. science. Before um, a couple, I think it was a couple of decades ago, the atom was the smallest um, element. And now we're finding out the atom is made up of biaps and zeds and quarks and mm -hmm. things of that nature. Uh, but science is able and willing to rewrite their documentation. They're willing to be wrong. And, uh, whereas historical documentation, the people who did that, they're not necessarily willing to do the same thing. So if it came something that I, if I was capable of doing, there are quite a few documentation, but I would prefer to rewrite everything because I would rewrite it as a history, as a story, shall I say, almost as a movie is told, uh, to be able to tell people why this seemed this way and fill in the blanks of, you know, the untold or things that didn't make sense. Okay. Uh, and are there any things that we haven't talked about or that you'd like to, to express uh, that we haven't touched upon? Uh, kind of maybe last thoughts or? Oh, that we're all of this earth. Uh, I don't think there's anything last thought or last minute about this conversation that we're all of this earth and that there should be an acceptance that um, in every country there's Aboriginal people of dark skin and, and skin tone. Mm -hmm. I think that this country needs to accept that as well, that there's going to be dark-skinned people that don't look at themselves as black, don't look at themselves as red, just look at themselves as native people who uh, find pride in their culture and heritage. Even if they were once called savages, uh, we don't look at it that way. We think it's very prideful. We think that people have accepted the Native American and American Indian life, and everyone has the right to identify themselves. So if anything I had to close that out on, I'll be closing that on that everyone has the right to identify themselves and know whom they are and be accepted for who they know they are in their heart. All right. Well, Chief Seeker, thank you so much. Thank for, you. I really appreciate it. It's a great honor uh, for me uh, personally and for the entire program to, uh, to be with you. And uh, again, thank you for sharing your time. Thank and you so much. I appreciate it so much and for all you're doing for our people. All right. You're welcome. All right.